Well, Hubs has been asking all summer long when I was going to make pesto, and it's been a busy summer, so I just didn't get around to it. But I did go out and harvest all of my Genovese basil before we got our first frost, and it smells so fragrant, it's just absolutely divine. And now I'm gonna blanch a lot of it so I can make a batch of, paste, of pesto later today. So I've got a large pot that's filled with boiling water, and I'm gonna add just a couple of teaspoons of salt to it. I've got one of these Asian spider ladles, that's hard for me to say, spider ladles, which has a bamboo handle and works brilliantly for this, you guys. And then my water is pretty much already boiling. So I've got probably three to four loosely packed cups of basil leaves in here, and I'm going to put it into the water just for about 10 to 15 seconds. I don't want it to be in there any longer than that for a couple of different reasons. Number one, I want it to retain as much of its flavor as possible. Who knew there was kind of controversy about whether or not basil really retained the intensity of its flavor if you blanched it? but I don't really care if it does or not because I just like the way it looks when it really maintains that gorgeous deep green color. I think that's part of the allure and the beauty of pesto. So I've got like, as I've said, three to four cups, if I didn't spill half of it in here, and I'm just going to submerge it into that boiling water. I'm gonna to count to 10. in Mississippi, and then I'm immediately going to ladle it out with my spider ladle, and I'm gonna put it into an ice water bath, which I already had prepped, a large bowl. And I do this in batches because I want to have individual servings that I can then freeze and pull out one by one in the winter as I want to use them. So then I can have summer fresh pesto all winter long. Now I'm not gonna leave it in this ice water bath for any length of time before I ladle it out of here. And I've got just a terry towel lying here to the side. I could use paper towel, but I, I just like to use a regular old cloth towel. And I'll keep that water on boil because I'm gonna do, as I said, multiple batches of it. And then I'm just gonna roll it up. And I'm gonna squeeze it tightly to get all of the moisture out of it. And then to make just a small batch of pesto, you can see I've already made oh. one <laughs> blanch. Stuart, pull it away from me. I've give got, me some room. give me some room. And I've already got one roll ready. So now I can take each one of these individual rolls and freeze it separately. And then when I wanna make a batch of pesto, I just cut off, oh, about an inch of that roll. And there you go. That's how you blanch garden fresh basil. Oh my goodness, it smells so yummy. So let's do this. I absolutely think that having a food processor, I've got a Cuisinart, is indispensable for this. And it just makes it so much easier and so much faster. So I'm going to start out and I'm going to make a double batch. So I've got two of those rolls of basil that I've already blanched. And that was about six cups of basil. And then I'm gonna put in uh, a teaspoon. And this is just a basic recipe. You can kind of modify it as you will, but this is just a basic recipe that I got off of, of the internet that's modified a little bit based on um, a couple of things. Some friends of mine have told me, I've got two thirds cups Remember, I'm making a double batch, and we will put the recipe in our newsletter and on Instagram. So if you've not signed up for our newsletter, make sure that you go to Linda Vodder, www.lindavodder.com, and sign up for the newsletter. You know, subscribe, hit the like button, all of that kind of stuff. I love um, 
you love the measuring cups. I know they're kind of fun. I, Leah, we need to make sure to put a link. Now, this is a really fun thing. This is a garlic peeler. Now, you don't have to have this. I realize this. You could do the <laughs> standard thing where you just bang it with the blade of your knife. But then I always get the sticky part, the skin of the clove that sticks to my fingers and I can't get it off. And this little tube, this magic little tube separates it for you and you don't have to remove those little bits and pieces of the skin yourself so that it, mine, like I say, it always got stuck to my finger. So this is a handy little thing. I think I gave them last year as stocking stuffers. So I've got two large cloves of garlic in there. Now I am modifying this myself. I do not use pine nuts. I use walnuts typically, and I've lightly toasted some walnuts. I've got about six tablespoons of walnuts in here. And I think toasting them, over a flame makes all of the difference for depth of flavor. And then I'm gonna put in, this is a double batch, a full cup of olive oil. So I've got that pre-measured. Now what I'm gonna do first is I'm just going to pulverize and pulse all of this. Now you can grate your own cheese or you can get it already grated. And typically I do grate it myself. But in this case, I pressed the easy button. Okay, now I'm just gonna pour in this cup of olive oil. Any good quality virgin olive oil will do. until a good goopy kind of paste is formed. Now at this stage, I typically look to see if it looks a little bit too loose or if I want it to be a little bit thicker. And in this case, that is a pretty good consistency. I found if it's a little too thick, it's hard to spread on the pasta or on the bruschetta or whatever it is that I wanna use it for. So I kind of like this consistency. I think I'm gonna add a tiny bit more cheese and then it'll be ready to go. Now you can use this obviously immediately. Uh-huh, Stuart says. Preferably immediately. Uh, you can store it in the refrigerator for a bit or you can do like I always do with some of it and that is freeze it because is there anything quite so luxurious? as having fresh, garden fresh, basil pesto in the winter time. Well, this is a little life luxury, not for me, but for hubs, because we have in the past had one of those great big heavy toasters that could toast like four to six pieces of bread at one time. It was kind of big, it was kind of clunky, and it was too big for me to like to have out on the counter. But Hubs really wanted to have a toaster that he could access easily and not have to schlep in and out when he wanted to make toast in the morning. So I bought him this really cute Frigidaire, really retro looking toaster. It can only handle two pieces, but that's fine since it's just Hubs and myself right now. But I think it's really cute, isn't it cute, Stuart? Like and Stuart was surprised that it's so light. He yeah. was expecting it to be really, really heavy. But I love the way it looks in my old house. And Hubs likes the fact that he doesn't have to get it in and out of the pantry when he makes his toast in the morning. So there you go. You never know where a little life luxury is going to come from. This one is compliments of Frigidaire. Okay, it's time for a couple of different things. It's time for me to plant some amaryllis bulbs and it's also time for me to have to wipe my nose because I just came in from outside in the cold and I 
had to tell Leah, run, get me a Kleenex right now. So it's cold and flu season, and it's also amaryllis bulb planting season because I think I've told you ad nauseum that I'm going to be on the Mesta Park Christmas home tour. And if I can, I want some of my amaryllis to be in bloom by then. So I need to pop them up now and see what I can do to get them to hurry up and start forcing out some of those gorgeous blooms. Now, thanks to color blends, I have all sorts of different varieties because I do this every year. And this one I am potting up right now is Double Delicious. It's red with white. It's gonna be 20 to 30 inches tall. And I am really going to make this arrangement pretty dramatic because I'm going to put three bulbs in just one pot. Now, if this pot looks familiar to you, it's because we did a Southern Living video. Gosh, how long ago was that, Stuart? Years years ago, but, but my pot has held up well where I made bark covered vases and containers to do things just like this, to plant amaryllis in, to use for uh, cut flower arrangements. And I think in the winter time and in the fall, they are just the perfect kind of seasonal note. Now, some of the, the bark and things on this one may have started to loosen. I may have to remedy it a little bit, but I'm going to pot it up first and then I will get my hot glue gun out and fix any blemishes on the exterior. Now, if you want to know how to make this from scratch, Stuart, let's put a little segment in right here where it shows that I just took a plastic nursery pot. I took lots of pieces of bark, complements of my firewood pile, and then with a hot glue gun and some some moss. I just covered the exterior of the pot itself with, with lots of bark. Now I've got a really good kind of lightweight potting mix here. Any potting mix for the most part will do. And then I'm just going to take this container, which does have drainage, and I'm going to fill it up about, oh, I'm going to say about halfway. And you can see here that to take up some space in this pot, I've just put another pot in there upside down, and there will be more than enough room in this container for these mammoth bulbs to put out root growth and grow down. Now these, I wanna make sure that I keep about the top third of the bulb and look at how huge these bulbs are. It's absolutely incredible how large they are. I just got them last week. If you get them before that, you know, keep them in a cool, dark place. A lot of times, if you haven't ordered them from a catalog like Color Blends, you can find them at um, big box stores at your local garden center. Um, you can order them online. Typically, I have found that places like Color Blends, the quality of the bulbs is so much better. They have haven't prematurely sprouted in their box, and I know the bulbs have been taken really good care of. So that said, I'm going to try to squeeze three bulbs in this one container, and I think it will be spectacular when it's in bloom. It will almost look like an amaryllis shrub. Now later on, I'm going to have to put some things in to support the heavy stems, but for right now, I am just going to pot them up, and I will insert the stems and the supports a little bit later. So. So I've got a good quality potting soil in here. I'm not adding any food. I'm not adding anything, any fertilizer, anything like that. I am only putting the bulbs in here. And what I like about being able to plant a trio, if possible, into one pot is they tend to kind of support one another because as you guys know, the flower heads for these amaryllis bulbs are really, really large. Now I'm gonna cram these in here. And you can see, I, I know I didn't either, <laughs> but have faith, Stuart. And that's the importance of having a flexible container. Yeah, because it will kind of accommodate and stretch along with it. Now, some of you may think, oh, this is way too many for one pot and it might be, but you know what? If it looks like the, the flowers themselves are gonna overwhelm the pot or if it just doesn't look stable or whatever, then I will just use the amaryllis as a cut flower and just cut it off from the bulb. But if not, think how grand this is going to be. So I'm gonna leave about a third 
of the bulb itself exposed. And by the way, I have been doing this since I was in high school, long before amaryllis were so ubiquitous and you could find them absolutely everywhere, drug stores, grocery stores, home garden centers. Um, and so I'm just going to fill this. And they don't, you know, they can grow even in water. The bulbs themselves, you can put them in a tall vase and just put water in there and they can grow without any soil whatsoever. But I'm gonna put some soil in here. And I'm gonna push down on the soil to make sure there are no voids because what I want to achieve ultimately is to have this kind of almost like a forest floor of different bark covered amaryllis in bloom. So if I move this, you can kind of see what that is going to look like and what it will look like then when I plant multiple pots with these amaryllis. And you can see here some pieces of the bark that I just hot glued onto the edge. This is the, is this the actual one from the video? Well, you see, I've had it for years. And yes, it, that was about three or four years ago. Gosh, oh, wow. but it's held up pretty well. Uh, it's held up through a move. <laughs> it's held up through <laughs> multiple trips up and down into the basement. So I will have two of these blooming bark covered pots filled with amaryllis. And then you might also recall from a past video that I took this section of tree trunk and I put a candle in it. So it will be illuminated amongst all of these blooming amaryllis. Now I'm gonna take this pot and I'm gonna water it with lukewarm water really saturating it, then I'm gonna put it in a place that's full sun, maybe even with a little bit of bottom warmth because I really want these to sprout as quickly as possible. But that said, amaryllis have minds of their own and they just bloom whenever they damn well please, excuse my French. Sometimes that means not until after Christmas, but you know what, that's okay too because then I can enjoy, enjoy them and enjoy all of their drama after the Christmas tree is already taken down and things look a little bit barren after the holidays. So I've got some other containers that I'm going to pot up with some different varieties. Most of them this year are in the red, white, and I've got some orange too, and we will put links to those below. Now some of them may have sold out, and if they have, then I would just recommend that you get whatever color blends still has available because all of their bulbs are absolutely exquisite and of good quality. I think I'm going to pot a couple of buckets here. And here's a tip. Stuart, we need to put our little tip icon right there. So I had these plastic pails. I think I, they were from Trader Joe's and they had some kind of pots in them. But just like this, I could kind of custom form it to the size of the bulbs because the plastic pot was malleable. These are two, these are flexible enough. So if I wanna get two into this basket, well, I can just bend them according to my will. Once I get these potted up, I can top dress them in moss. I can top dress them with pine cones. Um, I can top dress them in anything I please and it will kind of cover the white it will camouflage it and then I'll just have another beautiful container now obviously if you want to use just terracotta or concrete or ceramic you can do that too but however you decide to do it make sure that you take the time to pot up some gorgeous indoor amaryllis bloom for holiday uh, holiday drama and also for gift giving if that's how you roll so there you go potting up amaryllis for the holidays now that I've got them potted up, I am going to water them until water runs out the bottom. But then I'm going to put them in place and I'm gonna leave them alone and I'm not gonna water them for at least a week or until I see signs of leaves and new growth coming out of the top, a stalk or some kind of leafy green growth. I don't wanna overwater them. I don't want the bulbs to rot. So just kind of keep an eye on them. Once they start growing, then you wanna keep the soil 
moist, but definitely not saturated. You don't want to overwater them. Okay, a couple of other things. Leah has led a very sheltered life. <laughs> not only had she never blanched basil, but she also had not potted up an amaryllis bulb. And so we are going to take care of that today. I am going to be her mentor. Now that I've showed her how to pot up an amaryllis bulb, I am going to for <laughs> force, she's, she is going to force the bulb and I am going to force her <laughs> to pot one up. And then we're gonna do something fun. So my in-laws, Mamu and Papu, they used to do this every year. They would have amaryllis races and they would both pot up their amaryllis and then they, they would be a race to see who's bloomed uh, first. Do you remember this, Stuart? And who's ever bloomed first, um, yes, got to be taken out for dinner by the other one. Now, I also did this one time on Channel 4 with Linda Cavanaugh, and then we had a reveal like four weeks later to see whose had, had bloomed first. And even though I was the garden guru, we took, we took the paper bags off of the pots, and hers was like this tall and ready to bloom, and mine hadn't even sprouted yet. So like I say, amaryllis have a mind of their own. So this is a challenge, an LV team challenge. So here is one for Leah. Leah, come and get your flower bowl. Stuart in this too. Yes, Stuart, you are going to do it too. And no cheating and having Susu do this. Or Julia. These are all, by the way, these are all double dreams. So, They're all the same variety. If I show up with a different one in great shape. No, you it. can't. No, you can't <laughs> buy. You can't buy one at Trader Joe's and the Dancing Queen. Yes, and their Dancing Queen will get our disco on, and then I've got one too, and I will pop mine up, and we are going to have a race. Now, if you want to know any kind of tips or tricks to get them to bloom bloom earlier. I'm not going to share that with you. <laughs> you guys just have to Google that. Comment, and, leave some comments. Yeah, yeah leave some us, comments. Tell us how to leave some That's comments. Fine. So there's a question of the day. Have you ever had an amaryllis race with anyone, with a friend or a loved one? And one more thing. There's always one more thing. When you get bulbs from color blends, they come in these wonderful mesh bags. I take these bags, I wash them, Leah, and then I use them as produce bags when I go to the grocery oh, store. Yes, so no more plastic. I and Christmas gift bags. And Christmas gift bags, yeah, how, however, they're just kind of fun. So there you go, there is my challenge, and if you guys want to join in on our Amaryllis bulb race, then please do so. Make sure to put down in the comments below that you are in, or you can go to the community section and put that you are in. You can send me pictures. We will try to post them. Um, and also we'll put this challenge up in our newsletter. So it's just a little fun that we can all have together. And that is a race to bloom. Well, before we start talking about little life luxuries, let's talk about a great big luxury. And that is the ability to go out into your own garden and cut flowers for beautiful centerpieces and flower arrangements. So this past week we had our first freeze and beforehand I went out there and I cut back pretty much anything that was blooming. So I cut back my dahlias, some of my hydrangeas, some of which were starting to take on that kind of character characteristic oh, dusty pink, but I also cut lots of foliage, just some Nandina branches, um, some of that mahogany splendor hibiscus. Uh, what else do I have in here? I've got some pink hydrangeas on the other side, all of which I think came together to just make a really beautiful arrangement for in front of the painting in, in the kitchen. Now this is, it's turned out to be one of my favorite vessels to use. It's just a basket, just a rectangular basket, and then in it, I put what is a little luxury, one of those rectangular flower arrangers that's got a top and it really holds up the flowers, but gives you enough space for enough volume of water to keep everything hydrated. And it fits and nestles just beautifully into this basket. So while we're talking about little life luxuries, I didn't want to ignore
ignore the very obvious big luxury, and that's just the luxury of having a garden um, first and foremost. Now for some fun things. So we're actually shooting this on Halloween, and I don't want to, I don't want to stamp on top of Halloween and go straight to Thanksgiving. I do want to live in the moment, but I also want to give you guys enough time um, as we all start to think about our Thanksgiving tablescape, and it takes time to do that. So I wanted to share with you some inspiration for what I'm going to do. And my thematic for this Thanksgiving is just turkeys. Now that may seem rather bland, but in the past I have used colors, I have used flavors, I have used um, all sorts of different types of produce. And this year I'm just going with a basic American turkey. So along those lines, I started out, I I think I put these up, Leah, did I put these up as a little life luxury a while ago and then they sold out, but I think they're back, I think they're back in stock. And that's these tea towels. They come in sets of three. And when I saw them, I knew instinctively that I probably wanted to have them to make really massive napkins and use them for napkins on my Thanksgiving tablescape. So I ordered enough for all of my friends and family that will be here and that I will be setting the table for and I think they'll really be beautiful. They are from a company called Maison de Hermine. Hermine, I'm probably butchering that, but you can find these online. They're at a great price point. And if, if for some reason they don't have this particular style, then you might look at some of the other ones they had. They were all just beautiful. And I love the fact, again, that they're massive. Now, as I said, I'm gonna use mine as napkins, but if you wanted to use these as a hostess gift, or to just adorn your own kitchen, I think they would be great. For younger people, a lot of times when I was in college or in high school, I would go to other people's homes because I lived here away from my family and I would go to other homes for Thanksgiving and I always wanted to bring something as like a little hostess gift. So I think these would make great hostess gifts as well. So that is my component number one. My component number two is something that on and off I have done for many years, not every year, but on and off, and that is to make maple uh, turkey-shaped shortbread cookies for each one of my guests. Yes, that's kind of hard to say, and I make pretty large ones. I package them up in glassine bags, and I have them at each place. Well, since my thematic this year is turkeys, definitely I have to do that again. I think I'm gonna recruit some of the neighbor girls from across the street to help me, and I am definitely gonna have to clean out my pantry to excavate my very favorite cookie cutter that I use for just this purpose. And we will, later on in next week's news, letter, I think, is when we're going to post the recipe if you want to make them too. They are, I have to say, oftentimes of all of the pies and all of the sweets that you can have at Thanksgiving, a lot of times this shortbread was my favorite. It's really, really decadent. And those cookies make a great little takeaway gift for your guests. Another fun thing that I'm going to have at each place setting are these little tea light turkey candle holders. And I think they're just whimsical. They're kind of rustic. And actually, I'm not sure. Some of them are sitting on the ground kind of nesting. Some of them are standing up and and um, oh and look, yes, yes, <laughs> and, and, and looking very dandy. I may or not, may not put tea lights in them. I might use them as little individual butter dishes. I might use them for little Jordan, with little Jordan almonds in them or something, M &Ms chocolates. Or yeah, M&M's or Reese's Pieces. I'm not really sure. I'm waiting for inspiration to hit me, but nevertheless, I think they are as cute as can be. And they can both be, I think, oh, kind of sophisticated, but also really whimsical for little kids. I just think they're a hoot and I just, or a gobble. <laughs> And I really love them. And we'll put a link below. Now, as I said earlier, I'm gonna make those cookies. I'm gonna put them in big wax or glassine bags. And then I'm going to secure them at the top with a couple of punched holes. And then in them, I'm going to put this turkey 
feather to secure the top. And I think that'll be kind of fun too. I'm not sure what other little adornments that I might have on my table that speak to turkey as my thematic, but I think they're fun and I think they're kind of little life luxuries that I can use throughout the holiday season and from year to year. Well, here's just a little tease because I'm starting to think about Christmas earlier than I normally do. Normally, I don't think about it until closer to Thanksgiving, but because I'm on the Mesta Park Christmas Home Tour this year, I am thinking about it in advance. So this is just a little tease that next week, you're gonna to wanna to make sure to stay tuned because I'm going to go down into the bowels of my basement. We're gonna start looking through some of my, I know, some of my Christmas decorations to see what will make the cut for the home tour and what will just have to stay down there in their sorry, dusty Christmas bins.